DLF and DKLF in the 70s, grew up and came to being in a highly repressive and dangerous environment where there were no uh, democratic rights to organize in opposition, and people who tried to found themselves very quickly running afoul of the authorities. Uh, so the conditions of unrelenting political repression and risk encouraged a culture of secrecy and subterfuge for uh, people's very survival. And that became really embedded in the liberation movement culture, a culture that also, around the world really at the time, the third world liberation movement uh, uh, culture, also drew heavily on Leninist models of uh, political organization, democratic centralism, uh, very it was all about centralism and not really so much about democracy. Um, but an authoritarian style of organizing uh, that was, you know, again, enhanced by the very difficult environment that people started. Uh, Isaiah, of course, had those authoritarian tendencies reinforced uh, by his uh, training in China at the height of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I don't think it all came from there, but it certainly helped give shape to his thinking, particularly the voluntarism uh, embedded in Maoist thinking, the, the notion that you can uh, remold people and create a new man, a new woman, uh, through uh, disciplined political education. And, and a lot of that was reflected in the approach to the EPLF, and within it, the EPRP. But this, this was clearly not just an import. Um, <laughs> the, both the EPLF and the ELF had a tendency to try to monopolize the national movement. The early ELF uh, manifested that in its efforts to wipe out the Eritrean liberation movement uh, back in the 60s. In the early 70s, the ELF set out uh, to uh, eradicate the upstart uh, groups uh, came together to form the EPLF, arguing at the time uh, that there can be no more than one struggle, one organization, and one leadership in our country. And in effect, the EPLF turned the tables and argued the same thing uh, in the other direction uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, pretending in many respects to be promoting uh, a, a unity process when in fact uh, trying to use that process itself to undermine the ELF. And that all came to a head uh, in the early 80s when, with the help of the allied TPLF. The EPLF drove the ELF out of the country. So I think, it, it, without trying to parse this too deeply, there is a long history of these authoritarian tendencies um, in, in, in the liberation culture in general and in the experience there. In the EPLF's case, the sharpest early signal where it was going in this respect was the Mecca uh, story that took place in the early 1970s. And if you're not familiar with that, I really urge you to read more about it. If you are, I'm not going to take everybody through it now. Uh, Guy Tukov has written about that. Uh, I've written uh, about it as well. Um, but I think it gives you a, a, a very clear signal of uh, the, the lack of tolerance that was uh, guiding the uh, core leadership of EPLF way back then. Um, and of course, a key piece of the EPLF's experience is the role played by the EPRP. And I just started to get at that uh, in uh, 2000. Uh, it, it struck me that this was an important part of the EPLF that was being very carefully hidden. Although, as I mentioned it in the uh, uh, the Congress of the, that launched the KPJ uh, in 1994, it never really came out in any uh, detail. People didn't really want to talk about it. So I started digging around and trying to write about it. And I, I wrote a paper which I presented at the Aritran, International Aritran Studies Association Conference in Asmara in July of 2001. This is really a time when there was a tremendous amount of debate and criticism uh, questioning going on, also a sense that the end was uh, nearing uh, for this, and, and, and there was a lot of fear. Uh, 
at that time. But when I came out and presented that paper, I was immediately uh, taken aside by uh, Sharifo, uh, by Solomon, uh, and by others, saying, you know, you've got some of that right, but there's more to it, uh, and you got some of it wrong. Uh, so let's sit down and talk some more. Conversations of Eritrean political prisoners, which here started really with conversations with Duro in the early part of 2000 about the party, trying to figure out its role inside this. And he just opened up on that because it was obvious that he was, at that time, beginning to reflect on his own role in this uh, and questioning the, the results. And of course there was, uh, at that time, already a lot of struggle going on inside the PFTJ that uh, wasn't yet public. But all the way through this whole experience, through the EPLF's uh, existence, through the formation of the state in the 1990s and certainly today, what we see is that the formal structures of the institutions that we encounter uh, in, in our chat uh, have very little relationship to the substance of power and decision making. The real power is uh, held by hidden networks that operate within a lot of different external structures. Uh, and I don't have a, a, a conclusion now on whether there's a secret party inside the country today, but I think there's a good chance that there is because it looks a lot like it did uh, during the 1970s and 80s uh, with people in a lot of different uh, positions within the, the governing structure of the military, in the National Security Services, uh, in the PFEJ, uh, in the President's office, uh, individuals, uh, of course, uh, in, in other ministries and outside, who seem to have a, a lot of uh, connection at times with one another and, and impact on, on decisions without the particular institution that they're in uh, being the source of it. Uh, I just I put some of these things out there. Maybe we can talk about them some more. I'd be interested to hear what you think uh, about that as well. The upshot, of course, of, of this situation, uh, this, uh, this heavy repression that set in <coughs> after 2000, 2001, uh, all in the name of national security, uh, and, and, and fed by the, the fear uh, that I know many people, many Eritreans share, uh, that to challenge the regime is to open up Eritrea uh, to potential uh, uh, interference in a, in a very big way from Ethiopia, uh, up to uh, and including the possibility of the effort to retake uh, all or part of the country. Um, and I'd be happy to come back and talk about uh, that as well, because I think it's really a crucial feature of the situation. It's certainly one of the, uh, the only explanation that I can come up with, uh, but is still where he is. In the early part of this year, uh, the flow of Eritreans in Ethiopia began to increase. Uh, there are still uh, quite a number of people going out through Sudan and then coming to Ethiopia because Sudan uh, has become much more dangerous. Uh, the UN uh, was estimating the total in Ethiopia at somewhere around 76,000 uh, and forecast by next year 90,000. Uh, the, the people who come across the border and are uh, channeled into the camps uh, are spread out with two camps in the Afar areas in northeastern uh, Ethiopia and three that I discussed in the slides in northwestern uh, Ethiopia, and then of course there are Eritreans elsewhere in the country. But in terms of Eritreans' experience in Ethiopia, the real turning point came in 2010, two years ago, a little over two years ago. Uh, really around the time that uh, Ethiopia and the Ethiopian uh, regime really went through a kind of reassessment of its relations with Eritrea and of, of, of how to deal with it. And one of the sparks for this was the uh, alleged uh, 
so before that. There had been a considerable struggle inside the TPL, as I think many of you are aware of. And by the end of it, Mellis pretty well had consolidated his position. Uh, others have not been arrested, as happened, of course, in Eritrea. They had left the movement of the party. Um, some uh, to remain in Ethiopia, some to go abroad. Um, but his ability to deal with the situation without uh, the threat that so many people talked about for so long uh, had, uh, had, had really increased. Uh, he was more in control than ever. Uh, and they went through a reassessment that, according to him, involved looking at the emotionalism attached to the resumption of war in 1988 to 2000 and the stupid things, these are his words, that they did at that time, including the deportation of tens of thousands of Eritreans. And they turned around uh, to try, in effect, to change the policy toward Eritrea from one of just containment to want to change, based in part on their own reassessment of the situation, and also of the increased threat that they were facing uh, in, from proxy organizations operating inside Ethiopia and uh, the surrounding area, uh, at a time when they were trying to focus on a whole set of other political and economic projects. That reassessment led to a strategy built around trying to increase the pressure on Asmara, uh, first lobbying for stronger sanctions at the UN, the AU and the UN. And then eventually, in, starting in March, launching a, a series of attacks on what Malice called hard targets inside Eritrea, targets that were military uh, in nature, uh, mainly around the training centers or groups that were operating inside Ethiopia. Uh, there was a lot of publicity around the attacks that took place in March. Uh, there were shots being fired when I was there in May and June, uh, somewhere around about May. You probably saw some reports of that on the internet. Uh, and, and I am under the impression, also from talking to refugees, uh, that there have been small incursions back and forth uh, uh, ever since. Um, 2010, uh, the government and others also stepped up, uh, made very public, actually, its uh, efforts to strengthen the Eritrean opposition forces that were based there, a bigger commitment to the EDA, uh, support for the National Council, and so on. I, I think, frankly, that by this time, they have decided that's really not going to lead to very much. I think they have not changed their approach there, but lost faith and of course, what we've seen in the last uh, uh, four to six months is an increased effort to try to encourage young people to come together to become more active in the <coughs> That in part comes from the fact that they have such a strong core of young Eritreans uh, coming out of the National Service uh, and, and up there in the camps and also in the towns and cities. Um, 